Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. In a people-centered city, does sex work deserve a place? Mainstream media are endlessly fascinated by the industry. Politicians and police compete to crack down and put places like strip clubs out of business. We even allow vigilantes to set themselves up as our moral avengers, usually men like Brian Bates of John TV. So what about the sex workers themselves? Do they deserve a say in all of this? Journalist Melissa Jira Grant is author of the new book, Playing the Whore, The Work of Sex Work, just out from Verso. Congratulations on the book, Melissa. Thank you so much. So let's start with your subtitle, Melissa, The Work of Sex Work. Um, work appears twice. You clearly care about the concept. Um, what do you mean? What are you getting at? I, this is the most missing part in the conversations about sex work that I feel like most people want to have, which for me, sex work is fundamentally a question of work, not of crime, not of law and order, not even of oppression. Uh, but this is something that people do to survive, like any other job. But for some reason, that's a very controversial claim, and that's because of sex, right? Like people are having a very challenged, a very challenged by thinking about sex as a kind of thing that you could trade um, or something that you could commodify. And you know, I understand that raises all kinds of questions for people, but for sex workers, this is fundamentally about what they do to survive. It's about the money that they need to live on. It's a question of, of labor and of rights. And you say in, somewhere in, early in the book that you have some skin in this game. Yes, I had been a sex worker for 10 years doing different kinds of sex work, um, in part because journalism is a really hard business to break into. <laughs> and in a way, this was funding you know, my various unpaid or very underpaid work as a journalist. So you know, I understand sex work as part of the mainstream economy. You know, it's the, the work that people can do to support what they need to do when the money isn't there. So talk for a minute to those who are more on the receiving end of mainstream media, perhaps, mm -hmm. and who are really concerned that sex work is not anything that women go into freely, that it has a, you know, devastating effect on the women that participate. And that can often lead to, you know, a lifetime of pain and suffering for the women involved. Uh, the mainstream picture of sex work is actually what got me into journalism because I felt like the kinds of stories that really dominate in the media, stories about violence, exploitation, uh, stories about sex trafficking, far got a greater hearing and, and I think pulled on people's heartstrings a lot more than stories about sex work as just a job that people did. Like the absolute ordinariness of sex work as I experienced it was not really represented in the media. And so those kinds of, you know, sometimes salacious stories, as, you know, just to be blunt about it, um, would dominate the real life picture of sex work as I knew it. So that was one of my inspirations for, for doing this book and doing this work. There's also policy work. There's a story recently in the New York Times about how genius it was that some policy maker had figured out how to put strip clubs out of business in the Bronx by denying them liquor licenses. Right, and at no point do people ask, well, how do we know that strip clubs are dangerous for communities? Why is this the, the presumption that, that um, putting them out of business rests upon? There was no um, treatment in that piece, the one in the New York Times that, that um, talked about the Bronx strip clubs, of the dancers themselves and what impact this would have on their wallets and what they were going to do. Would there be another club for them to work at? Um, you know, I understand that the community has a stake in what goes on in the community, what kind of businesses are there, but sex workers are part of that community too. Well, talk about what place the, this industry plays in a community economy or ecology, if you will. Sure. I think, you know, just to start with sort of the conventional picture of sex work in the city, people have this image. Um, I refer to this as the prostitute imaginary, this character, usually a woman, sometimes a woman of color, mini skirt, fishnets, boots, leaned into a car, right? We've seen this stock image and story after story. And that kind of character ends up becoming the stand-in for, I think, how people think sex work actually operates. Uh -huh. When in reality, because of forces like gentrification, because of the kinds of policing that we see in cities, particularly to talk about New York for a moment, just the kind of racial and gender-based profiling that we see in policing, um, the people who are doing sex work that look like that character, that population is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking mm -hmm. because that is who the pe police are most focused on. And that's where public attention is most focused on. We're not focused on the vast majority of the industry that's actually operating behind closed doors. The Elliot that, Spitzer part of the industry. The Elliot Spitzer part of the industry and everything in between, right? Like the mom and pop strip club that's off the highway or the porn theater that's underneath the overpass, you know, like these, 
it's the idea of like a red light district in the city is something that's like almost extinct. Mm -hmm. And I think that has as much to do with, you know, ideas of sexual morality and community standards as it does with economic development and who gets pushed out of a city and who's seen as desirable and who's seen as undesirable. You write in your book about the many, many people that derive value from sex work. Like who? Journalists, it's an endless trove, just to, to be self-reflective for a minute. I mean, this is an endless topic for people to explore, but there's also the police, right? This is a, an avenue for policing. Um, there's actually increasing funds available for vice policing because of concerns about human trafficking. So very often, human trafficking operations are housed within the vice department, even though we know that human trafficking occurs in many different industries. But frequently, the lion's share of the resources are going to anti-prostitution law enforcement. Um, and then there's you know kind of a third group that the anthropologist Laura Augustin describes as the rescue industry. Um, these are folks who operate projects that are designed to remove sex workers from sex work and to offer them services, alternative employment. Sometimes these are the promises they make. It's not necessarily something they are offering, mm -hmm. um, but the kind of service side of the industry. That what about people like the John TV guy? Well, I mean, this is this is a way that people can become notorious, right? Because it is a salacious story, and he can present himself as someone who... Uh, is brave enough to tell the story but you know when I look at something like John TV I see somebody who is you know himself almost part of the industry his behavior is quite like an abusive person posing as a customer mm -hmm. who's trailing after sex workers trying to surveil them trying to insert himself in their lives when that's unwanted it feels like the kind of predatory behavior that makes people very scared about the sex industry itself so let's, uh, let's ask a, answer, have you answer a pretty basic question which is is sex work necessarily forced work? Is it, um, do women have free choice to go into sex work? It's a hard question to ask without thinking of all of the work that we do. That's how I understand it. Um, it feels like we put such a double standard on sex workers to prove to themselves that they've made an empowered choice in a way that we don't ask that question about people in other kinds of service work that can also be quite exploitative. Um, you know, as my friend, the labor journalist Sarah, uh, Sarah Jaffe says, no one ever tried to rescue me from the restaurant industry when I was a waitress. And I feel like we, that's just... It's an interesting question. It's an important question, but it is a question that I think puts such a burden on sex workers to prove themselves, to prove that they are empowered, um, when I think the more basic question might be, well, what kinds of power and control do you have at work? What does it look like when you need to take a day off? Are you going to be penalized for that? Do you, can you choose the kinds of customers that you want to see? Can you choose the kinds of safer sex that you want to have? Those are much more fine-grained questions, and I think they speak much more to the reality of sex work than sort of these big picture ideas about empowerment and choice. Where does the movement stand? I mean, in the in the 70s and 80s, there were organizations like Coyote representing, well, creating basically a union for sex workers in the West Coast. There have been organizations that were roughly defined as feminist organizations defending the rights of sex workers. There's also been tremendous feminist backlash. Where are we right now? The sex workers' rights movement, you know, is older than that even. You know, some people would put its roots back to Stonewall even, you know, in the gestures of women like Sylvia Rivera, of Marsha P. Johnson, folks who were essentially funding gay liberation by hustling. Mm -hmm. And there's such an interconnectedness of those two movements. Like, I would say, like, let's go back a little bit further. And the women's movement in some ways um, in the 70s thought of prostitutes sort of in the symbolic way. You know, these are the women that were thought of as being the most oppressed amongst us all. Um, but even in the 70s, I don't think the women's movement really considered that sex workers were people with their own demands and, and had their own political projects and that they were the experts and that they needed to be taking the lead. And that's the thing that I think is the most neglected right now, that there, there's a proliferation of feminist projects to save and rescue sex workers, and there are very few projects that sex workers are leading that get nearly the same kinds of resources mm -hmm. and attention. So what would you do if you were in some kind of policy-making position, whether in policing or education or government, um, what would you like to see put in place to address some of the concerns you've raised? I, I feel like it's so above my pay grade <laughs> in some ways. But, you know, here's what I would do. Yeah. If I were, you know, invited into a city planning meeting, if I were, you know, invited to give testimony on behalf of any number of these anti-prostitution policies that are multiplying across the country. Michigan right now is looking at 23 different anti-prostitution, anti-trafficking measures just introduced since the beginning of the year. So there's certainly a lot of opportunity to intervene. And what I would say is, 
where are the sex workers in this conversation? Um, at what point are you going to consult with the people who are going to be most impacted by this policy? And what kinds of power and decision making do they have in the process? Are they people that you consider yourselves to be fixing and rescuing? Or are they people that you consider to be a part of the community and part of the process? But how can these women, and there are some men too, and lots of trans people, how can they be part of a conversation when sometimes just being public is putting yourself at risk of being criminalized? Even speaking out about sex work, outing yourself could be opening you up to you know, different kinds of policing or other kinds of consequences, right? Even if it's not the police, you might lose your family, you might become um, you know, perceived as an outcast, even in the groups that you are part of, that you know, women's groups I remember being a part of in college when I came out as a sex worker, you know, that, was, that was it for some of those groups. So I understand the costs are really real. Um, but there are ways that people could do outreach to sex worker communities. I think of harm reduction projects that are active um, in many cities, folks who are doing syringe exchange, folks who are doing safer sex outreach. These are people who have contact with people in the sex industry, can build relationships and help open up the political process so that sex workers aren't stuck on the outside. If you were doing one thing right now to help a, a young person perhaps who's considering going into this industry maybe to um, subsidize her journalism, good for her, um, what would you say? What, what, what would be your advice? You know, I would say find your community. And there, fortunately with the internet, there's many more options for people who are even isolated, who don't know any other sex workers in their day-to-day -day lives which is most people, um, you know, you have an opportunity online to connect with people who are in the sex industry who can let you know that you're not alone. Can you share information, sort of how-to information, how to keep yourself safe online without being, getting in trouble? That's something that's quite risky because even in, in online communities where sex workers have you know, created password protected message boards, for example, to share information about dangerous customers, law enforcement have actually infiltrated some of those message boards as part of anti-prostitution mm -hmm. policing. So the very measures that people take to stay safe sometimes can also expose them to criminalization. So the internet might be a way to meet people, but people are still reliant on face-to-face -face relationships in order to actually share the kinds of information they need to stay safe because of the criminalized environment we are operating in. So what do you want to accomplish with your book? My point with the title is to say that this is a role. Yeah. This isn't a who you are. This isn't something that, you know, I think we think that there's this line in the sand that people cross where, you know, this is something you only do if you have no other options and no other choices. And once you do it, it marks you for life. And the intervention I'd like to make on that to say is that's not necessarily true. There are so many people who do sex work that aren't out about it that we'll never know. And it's not something that makes you an outcast. It's our perceptions about sex work that marginalize and push people to the side. And that that's what needs to be changed. So if anything, the intervention is on everybody outside of sex work <laughs> to say, this is what sex workers have to say about their lives. It's time to listen. Playing the Whore, The Work of Sex Work is just out from Verso Books. Melissa, Jara Grant, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you.